Quetzalcoatlus, Terror from the Skies. Many mental health experts say that practicing gratitude is an easy way to center yourself and maintain happiness. You can express gratitude for your friends and family, your health, or even your pet golden doodle. If that's not enough, you could always be grateful for the fact that you weren't born in the predator-filled ecosystem of the Cretaceous period. 65 million years ago, the earth, sea, and skies belonged to fearsome beasts that wouldn't hesitate to rip you limb from limb, if not gobble you whole. Today's video focuses on an aerial predator whose shadow spelled curtains for many a poor Cretacean soul. We're of course talking about Quetzalcoatlus, the terror from the skies. What was Quetzalcoatlus? Quetzalcoatlus is the genus name of extinct pterosaurs under the Asdarkidae family. There were actually two confirmed Quetzalcoatlus species, Quetzalcoatlus northropi and Quetzalcoatlus lasani. Nothropi was the larger of the two species and is still debated to have been the largest flying animal ever. What isn't debated as much, though, is that Quetzalcoatlus nothropi was probably the largest flying animal ever discovered in North America. To date, Quetzalcoatlus fossils have only been found in North America, with the first nothropi specimen discovered at the Javelina Formation in West Texas Big Bend National Park in 1971. Douglas A. Lawson, after whom the Lawsani species is named, is the paleontologist who unearthed the bones of this fearsome flying dino. The very first fossil was a partial wing, consisting of a forearm and an elongated finger, marking it out as a pterosaur. However, Lawson and his colleagues were shocked by the scale of the fossils, which indicated that the wing belonged to a creature of unprecedented proportions. Using a scale of known pterosaurs, paleontologists deduced that the animal they had discovered would have had a potential wingspan of 33 feet, or 10 meters. For context, that's a similar wingspan to a Cessna 172 aircraft. Throughout the rest of the early 70s, Lawson and Professor Juan Langston Jr. of the Texas Memorial Museum dug up three more partial fossils that were similar but smaller. At first, paleontologists figured that the duo had stumbled upon a nesting territory occupied by mature specimens and juveniles. In 1975, Lawson wrote journal entries for the science magazine declaring his first find, TMM41450, as a new discovery. The new pterosaurus genus was named Quetzalcoatlus, after the Aztec god of priesthood Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl is often depicted as a feathered serpentine creature. The species name Northropi is after John Knutson Northrup, who founded the Northrop Corporation that developed flying wing aircraft designs similar to Quetzalcoatlus in flight. Upon further examination, the smaller Javelina fossils, which featured partial skulls, were deemed to be mature individuals of a separate species. Quetzalcoatlus lasoni was the name chosen for this new species. What did Quetzalcoatlus look like? Quetzalcoatlus was certainly a big bird-like dinosaur, much larger than any pterodon ever discovered in North America. Northropi is believed to have had a wingspan as wide as 52 feet by some estimates, but this is hotly debated. Conservative estimates give the animal a 36-foot wingspan, while generous estimates lean towards 69 feet. For context, the Andean condor, the bird with the widest wingspan today, measures 10 feet 10 inches from wingtip to wingtip. On the ground, Quetzalcoatlus could partially stand on its hind legs, although it mostly walked and galloped on four limbs. Its shoulder height when bipedal would have been just under 10 feet. Weight estimates are pretty much a shot in the dark because there is no basis for the animal's muscle mass. At the high end, Quetzalcoatlus northropi may have weighed between 450 to 550 pounds, while conservative estimates are as low as 150 pounds. Quetzalcoatlus lasoni may have weighed between 45 to 143 pounds, with a wingspan of around 16 feet and a body length of 11 feet. Quetzalcoatlus also had a menacingly large and sharp beak. According to the National Geographic Society, a Quetzalcoatlus with a 33 to 40 foot wingspan would have sported a beak that was about 8.2 feet long. The dinosaur's neck was another standout feature. High estimates suggest it had a 10-foot-long neck that contributed to its incredible length. Quetzalcoatlus did not have a tail of note to speak of. The hind legs for the large nothropi specimens were around 7 feet long, taller than most humans. Skull fossils indicate a relatively large brain cavity and big eyes. This means it probably had exceptional eyesight, like many high-flying creatures. Quetzalcoatlus also had some sort of crest at the top of the skull, but without a full fossil specimen, no one knows what it looked like, how big it got, or what function it served. 
theorists have speculated that the crest may have been a flight rudder or a simple feature of sexual dimorphism, like antlers on male deer. Whether Quetzalcoatlus was covered in feathers, like the deity it was named after, is unknown. However, many depictions have featured the animal with a combination of feathers and scales, with feathers mostly concentrated along the neck and head. Coloration is also not known. When did Quetzalcoatlus live? Quetzalcoatlus lived in the Cretaceous period in the Maastrichtian age, so it lived between 72 and 65 million years ago. The genus direct ancestry is yet to be clearly established, but it certainly evolved from as dark kids that emerged in the early Cretaceous 150 to 100 million years ago. It is closely related to Hatsagopteryx and Arabargiania, fellow members of the Quetzalcoatlini subfamily that lived in Eurasia in the late Cretaceous period. Quetzalcoatlus also lived alongside Wellenhopterus, another Quetzalcoatlini genus, in the Javelina Formation region of modern-day Texas. The giant pterosaur likely fell alongside most of the dinosaurs during the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event of 65 million years ago. Where did Quetzalcoatlus live? Quetzalcoatlus species appear to have been fairly adaptable creatures that could have lived in a wide variety of environments. However, the concentration of fossil finds in the Javelina Formation, far from the ocean, suggests that they preferred inland plains. It likely concentrated near lakes and floodplains to be close to their prey. Quetzalcoatlus shared its environment with several pterosaurs, as well as ground-dwelling dinosaurs like Alamosaurus, Tenotosaurus, Texacephalae, and Achilarhinus. The warm and dry climate of West Texas was perfect for a wide number of pterosaurs, including Quetzalcoatlus. Lassoni is believed to have been the more sociable of the two species, living in flocks near large water bodies. Northropi may have been a solitary hunter, as its considerable size and energy demands may not have been ideal for living in groups. Both Quetzalcoatlus species were likely territorial rather than migratory because most fossils have been found in West Texas. Additionally, the relatively non-seasonal subtropical conditions of the region do not warrant cause for migration. What did Quetzalcoatlus eat? The toothless beak of Quetzalcoatlus has sparked a lot of debate about its feeding habits, although it's pretty clear that whatever feeding habits it employed were very bird-like. Quetzalcoatlus lassoni is believed to have been a wader, prowling lake shores and riverbanks in search of small fish, crustaceans, insects, and arthropods. It's likely that they also preyed on very smaller juvenile dinosaurs, snakes, and lizards. Quetzalcoatlus northropi was much higher up the food chain. A solitary hunter, Nothropi's larger size allowed it to go after larger prey. It mostly fed on terrestrial animals, including small dinosaurs, lizards, snakes, and mammal-like creatures. It certainly was capable of preying on other pterosaurs, but it's not clear whether it did. Small theropods and sauropods were likely staple parts of the diet. Quetzalcoatlus's beak also suggests that it was capable of skimming water surfaces to scoop up fish just below the surface. However, the size of Nothropi counts against this theory. Skimming would require extremely high levels of energy when taking off. Energy gained from fish caught this way simply don't break even with the energy exerted during such maneuvers. Perhaps the smaller Lassoni was a skimmer as its smaller body would demand less energy. While debates rage on, many experts agree that Northropi primarily foraged along the ground like storks or secretary birds, pouncing on prey and trapping it with a needle-nosed pincer of a beak. Both species were also expert scavengers who employed their flying and brilliant eyesight to scout for easy meals. With plenty of large herbivores being hunted or dying from age or illness, there were literal tons of free picking for the pterosaurs. We'll likely never know how much of Quetzalcoatlus' diet was from scavenging, but scavenging was definitely an option. With large theropods like Tyrannosaurus rex on the prowl, even the mighty Quetzalcoatlus was not an apex predator, but it would have been fearsome nonetheless. Flight Scientists have undertaken a few experiments to try and figure out how this prehistoric creature flew. However, drawing conclusions from any of them is difficult because it's unclear how heavy these animals were. Naturally, weight is a critical factor when it comes to flight. The first scientist to give it a serious go was American aeronautical engineer Paul McCready, who devised an ornithopter based on the then-contemporary weight estimates of 180 pounds. McCready's ornithopter, which also featured a small computer that ran the autopilot, flew successfully by flapping its wings and soaring. In the 21st century, some scientists argued that Northropi, in particular, was too heavy to fly, especially if it weighed over 400 pounds. However, other aero experts like Mike Habib and Mark Witten devised computer models that suggested that not only could Quetzalcoatlus fly, but it could fly for extremely long stretches. 
These models showed that Quetzalcoatlus could reach speeds of 80 miles per hour, altitudes of 15,000 feet, and flight ranges of up to 12,000 miles. They even claimed Quetzalcoatlus could fly for 7 to 10 days straight. The animal's takeoff is another mystery. The general consensus these days is that Quetzalcoatlus's massive legs were key to leaving the ground. Using an elevated surface or a run-up, Quetzalcoatlus would have used its powerful leg muscles to launch a few feet into the air, giving its large wings enough time to flap. The animal would have had extremely large chest and shoulder muscles to pull this off consistently. Flight was likely critical for finding food and escaping predators. Was Quetzalcoatlus the biggest pterosaur? This is yet another hotly debated topic. Of course, whether or not it was the biggest creature to ever soar the skies of Earth, Quetzalcoatlus is certainly in the conversation. The chief rivals to the claim are the aforementioned Hazagopteryx and Araborgiania. Hatsigopteryx is a large pterosaur whose fossils have been found in modern-day Romania. The consensus leans towards it being heavier than Quetzalcoatlus, but the exact difference between the two is anyone's guess since exact weights are difficult to prove. Aramborgiania is also believed to have been taller than Quetzalcoatlus, if not heavier. Its fossils have been found in modern-day Jordan. That said, Regardless of whether Quetzalcoatlus is the biggest pterosaur ever, it is certainly the most infamous and was a bona fide terror from the skies.